So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for joining us today for our long-term care facility management to optimize health and decrease infections webinar. My name is Erica Zeno. I am a member of the marketing team with Condare and will be your moderator this afternoon. Before we get started, I'd like to address a few housekeeping items. First, if you haven't already, please place yourself on mute. This presentation will run approximately 50 minutes followed by a 10 minute question and answer session. During the presentation, if there are any questions, please feel free to place them in the chat section. All questions will be addressed during the question and answer session or in a follow-up call or email if we happen to run out of time. A recording of this webinar will be sent to all registrants to review at their convenience. Certificates of attendance will be sent to all participants who have completed this webinar. And again, if you wouldn't mind taking a chance to just see, make sure that you're muted. This webinar will take a deep dive into how indoor environments can be managed to protect yourself and others from respiratory viruses and other infectious microbes. Buildings, our essential shelters, often contribute to the spread of infectious diseases and other occupant illnesses in surprising ways. Insight gained from COVID-19 pandemic revealed the clear need for properly managed indoor environments. Some takeaways that you can expect to learn from this webinar are how indoor air quality affects our health, what building characteristics contribute to virus transmission, why viruses can be more harmful in dry air conditions, the role humidity, temperature, and CO2 play in making buildings healthier, and the best practices and products to improve your indoor air quality. I am really excited to, into, into, sorry, to introduce our two distinguished speakers. The first will be Dr. Stephanie Taylor. Dr. Taylor received her MD from Harvard Medical School and practiced clinical medicine for several decades, becoming increasingly convinced that hospital indoor air management influenced patient healing. She returned to school to obtain her master's degree in architecture and engineering. Her work now focuses on understanding how all indoor air environments, sorry, her work focuses now on understanding on how all indoor environments impact occupational health. She is the founder of Building for Health and Taylor Healthcare Consulting. She is a Harvard Medical School Insight Health Fellow. She is an ASHRAE Distinguished Lecturer and is on the Epidemic Task Force and Environmental Health Committee and she is the medical advisor to Condare. Dr. Taylor, welcome to the webinar. Thank you, Erica, and thank you, Condare. I'm really honored to be here, and thank you to everyone who is uh, listening, and I hope you'll ask lots of questions. <laughs> Me too. Our second speaker will be Thomas oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I thought I forgot. To be okay, sorry. No, you're good. You're good. So our second speaker will be Thomas Klein. He is the Eastern he is the Eastern Regional Manager for Condair Inc., formerly known as Nortec Humidity. He holds an MBA from Penn State University in International Business and Logistics with over three decades of working with premier industrial corporations, including 3M. GE and Beiersdorf AG. He is passionate about uncovering needs and problem solving for his clients and their end users. With an expertise in humidification, energy reduction, and evaporative cooling, he provides much needed solutions for many commercial HVAC sectors, including healthcare, institutions, data centers, and other industrial markets. Thomas, welcome to the webinar. Thank you so much. Okay, and at this moment, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Dr. Taylor, and it's going to be just a slight pause. Well, okay, hello, Dr. Everyone. Taylor. 
Um, okay. Thank you, Erica, and thank you to Condare, and thank you to all the participants, and thank you to Thomas for uh, presenting, uh, letting us present together. So I'm really excited to be here, especially if I can advance, uh, Erica. Okay, let's try this again. Just one moment, please. Okay, now try again. Hmm. Okay. Oh, maybe. There you go. So in the next um, 25 minutes, I'd like to discuss with you the need to put occupant health into the building management equation. Um, then I would like to, to share with you a few studies that clearly uh, tell us how, how we can better manage buildings for health. And then at the very end, I'd like to just uh, raise the, the topic around how profitable indoor air hydration or humidification is. So when I think about putting occupant health into the building equation, you know, I realized um, several decades ago that medicine is in one silo where we treat the, the we're kind of in the business of sickness. You know, we, we wait for people to get sick and then we prescribe medications or surgery, but our focus in medical school on prevention is really lacking. And then on in another professional silo, building scientists, so engineers, architects, facility managers, anyone who interfaces with buildings kind of have a different vocabulary, a different set of evaluation metrics, different uh, criteria for success. After the 1970 energy embargo, we really began to focus on uh, energy conservation and sustainability, which is clearly important. But COVID-19 has reminded us that we need to consider the human being in the building when we do research on managing and evaluating the building. You know, that's easier said than done. And again, I prior to this presentation, I was reviewing uh, information on how much medical schools teach environmental hygiene to uh, rising doctors and it's really neglected in our curriculum you know we might learn about the toxicity of lead and certain specific things but we're not taught about how to manage buildings or how to even look at buildings as a component of environmental exposures which influence our health so engineers facility managers uh, builders are much further along this unification of health in the indoor environment than the medical profession is. And so I thank you for that. If we look back over time, if we go way back in time, uh, human beings, uh, you know, our initial shelters were really naturally made structures. Uh, we had a lot of exposure to outdoor air, water, soil, plant material, animal material. And then we became very sophisticated. We created new building materials, uh, new construction techniques, and we, we started developing more enclosed buildings. We developed um, sanitation systems for water, air. And really by 2021, after we've gone through the energy embargo, LEED has come into, into play. We've tightened up our buildings when we were still going to work, uh, we could go to work, you know, in a in a short sleeve shirt, even in the winter time, and still be warm. Our enclosed environments were warm, dry, you know, well lit. So as we've advanced our building technology, somewhat surprisingly, perhaps, we've also seen an increase in certain categories of infectious diseases. So. Clearly, uh, one of the categories which is evolving is infectious disease, which is why we're meeting um, on GoToWebinar. But it's not just infectious diseases that are caused by evolving pathogens that we, we've seen a change in. We've also seen an increase in many diseases which have an inflammatory basis. So for example, inflammatory bowel disease, cardiovascular disease, um, we now know is it, those problems are exacerbated by exposure to particulate matter, for example. We've seen an increase in allergies and autoimmune disorders. So as we've tightened up our buildings, there's been this concomitant rise in some diseases. 
So we need to ask the question, are we doing something indoors? Are we doing something in our building construction that is, is contributing to an increase in some diseases? One of my colleagues, Dr. Nickerman said, borrowing from Winston Churchill, we shape our buildings, then they kill us. So that's kind of discouraging. I think he must have been in a bad mood that day, but it bears looking at the possible relationship between what we're doing and these diseases. So here we are, 2021, dealing with COVID-19. But interestingly, if you look at the main epidemics or pandemics that have afflicted human beings, all of the viral ones have been caused by the same family of viruses. They're single-stranded RNA viruses, um, and they have a significant airborne component. The other thing about RNA viruses that are really interesting and very applicable to managing our indoor environments is that RNA viruses mutate frequently. And if one of the new mutated strains finds an environment in which it previously couldn't survive in, but it now can due to the mutation, and if that virus finds a new host, such as a human being without an immunological memory against it, the new environment and the undefended host sets up, sets the stage for a pandemic. So what, what I'm saying here is that we need to be really careful about how we manage our indoor environment where we spend 90% of our time so that we're not fostering the survival of more virulent or pathogenic viruses or bacteria. So this concept of managing the indoor environment to support human health is really important. So just to get a, a more uh, visual experience about what it's really like in our buildings, as I'm talking, droplets are coming out of my mouth, as you're breathing, same thing, and these droplets carry all of the normal particles and viruses and bacteria that are in my mouth, my nose, my airways. It doesn't mean I'm sick, that's normal. We now know that human beings carry lots of microbes which help us survive. You can also see as this woman is working away, she's shedding particles from her skin. They're landing on her paper, on her desktop. Particles are coming out of her nose that carry the, again, the organisms in her nose. Her GI system is illuminated because we have lots of bacteria and particles in our GI tract. You can see that as these illuminated particles and organisms land on surfaces, depending on the turbulence of the air, the humidity, uh, the directional airflow, there's communication between surfaces and the air. We live in a 3D world, so that's not too surprising. And then depending on how tightly sealed our buildings are, there's more or less ex air exchange between the outdoor environment and the indoor environment. So the reason I wanted you to see that video is that it shows you how active uh, the indoor environment is and how we interact with these particles and microbes that we shed and that come in from the outdoors. In, whoops. in fact, this is kind of surprising and it may, may, you may be a little bit grossed out until we think about that you don't need to be, but each of us sheds about 37 million microbes per hour into the air and onto surfaces. It takes about 15 minutes for your roommate's bacteria to be to land on your toothbrush in the bathroom. We also know that not only are we shedding these microbes and particles continually, but that the indoor environment will determine which ones survive inside and then go on to affect the, the health of the next person. So keep in mind that even though we're shedding a tremendous number of microbes per hour, 95% of these are actually good for us, and about 5% are not good for us. So clearly coronavirus is in that 5% that we don't want to have around. But we need to manage our environments to support the good ones and to uh, not preferentially support the pathogenic bacteria and viruses. So how we do that, we now know, is very much related to how we manage indoor air. So let's take a look at some studies that, that begin to point us in the right direction for managing the indoor environment and sp 
specifically indoor air, to support human health and the good microbes. So moving to in, uh, viral disease transmission, let's take, it to, take a look at the three steps where you can interfere with disease transmission. So step one, you can reduce your viral exposure. You can tell someone who's sick not to come in. You can tell them to put a mask on. Um, step two, managing the indoor environment is really where we focus and where ASHRAE focuses when, when we think about managing the environment to decrease disease transmission. And then the third category on the right, taking care of your health and immunity, is something that we generally leave up to either ourselves individually to eat well, exercise, get enough sleep. And we, we hope to all um, have the, an effective vaccine at some point. So it's really the middle category that we usually traditionally think of in uh, terms of building management. So think about for a second how you can do a study to understand how to manage the indoor environment to optimally decrease disease transmission. So to do this kind of study, you not only have to evaluate the environment, so evaluate the number of viral particles in the environment, or evaluate, for example, the concentration of VOCs or the temperature, humidity, but you also have to evaluate the impact of the indoor environment on human health. So to get a sense of, of the impact on human beings, you need to you need to monitor the human being. You need to collect data from the person if you're going to have a full equation around occupant health. So a great place to study both the environment and the humans in the environment is actually a hospital. And I say that not just because I'm a physician, but because we're already collecting a tremendous amount of data on the building occupant. If you think of the patient now as the biomarker or the petri dish in the bed or the canary in the mine. So this study is now from, my gosh, six years old. This is from 2015, um, done in, the, in a Chicago area hospital. So we took a brand new hospital and started monitoring the environmental conditions as well as the movement of bacteria and viruses into the building from before there were any patients to up to a year later. So the microbiologists were evaluating all of the parameters that you see listed in the middle every five to 30 minutes. So in patient rooms, they were looking at temperature, hand hygiene uh, compliance, pressurization, lighting, CO2, humidity, room traffic, room air changes, and outdoor air. Again, a new hospital, there were MERV uh, filters in place, I don't know if there was UVGI in the ductwork, but um, these were the variables that you see in front of you. So I was looked at patient outcomes and correlated patient infections, both bacterial and, and viral, with all of those uh, environmental parameters that you see listed. So we sent a massive amount of data off to our statistician who came back telling us that the most powerful correlation with higher infections in those rooms was low relative humidity. So the blue line shows the average relative humidity in patient rooms. The red columns show the infection rate. And so you can see on the x-axis that starting in the first winter, the infection rates were high. The relative humidity indoors was at its lowest point, around a little less than 32%. And as the year went on and we went into the summertime, the infection rate came down. Concurrently, the humidity went up in the rooms up to about 41%, and then the reverse happened in the subsequent winter. So we saw these data points, and I, I didn't really know much about humidity at that point, and I didn't frankly believe this. I thought, if anything, this is backwards. It should be uh, drier air has fewer things growing in it and fewer infections. So I thought that there had been a variable that had been missed. So we, we sent our data off to another statistician who came back and said, dry air is an independent correlation with higher infections. So I realized that um, this may be something we should pay attention to. So uh, then we, we then embarked on another study in a uh, senior living facility. This study is now six years in running. 
Um, this is both memory care facility and a uh, elderly nursing home. So again, we looked at the indoor environment. So in the patient rooms and correlated the, the physical parameters with patient infections. So the infections were both bacterial and viral. This uh, includes C. diff, norovirus, notovirus, um, influenza, coronavirus. And we also looked at other infections like urinary tract, eye, and skin. So respiratory, gastrointestinal, and then urinary tract, eye, and skin. And again, collecting a massive amount of data, um, our, we're, we're finding, again, that if we look at the x-axis where we have relative humidity and the y-axis showing the infection rate, when the relative humidity in this nursing home is less than 40%, we're seeing the highest rates of infection, with the exception of the green dotted line, which is urinary tract infections. So UTIs correlate with mobility and hygiene. but the respiratory infections, the gastrointestinal infections, skin and eye, all had the highest incidence when the relative humidity was less than 40%. We found this 40 to 60% zone where the, the human beings did the best indoors and the bad microbes seemed to be at their lowest uh, infectivity. So something was going on at 40 to 60% relative humidity, which was protective for these patients. Oops. This study is, is a this is an excellent study done by Dr. Ryman and her postdocs at the Mayo Clinic, where she actually took a, a preschool in northern Minnesota, humidified half of the school to 45%, and let the other half of the building do what buildings do in the cold winter time, bring in outdoor air, heat it up. And if you don't humidify it, the relative humidity falls. So they compared the humidified part of the school with the non-humidified part. And what they found was when you humidify the classrooms, there were a couple of important findings looking specifically at uh, influenza. They found that the humidified part of the school had fewer particles in the air. This is uh, evaluated with metagenomic analysis tools. They found that the actual infectivity of those particles so separate from the number, they found that the, the virulence of the viral particles in the humidified part of the school was less. And then ultimately they found that fewer kids got sick and were absent from school for in, because of influenza. So you can see there's a big difference between the number of absenteeisms in the humidified part of the school versus non-humidified. Then they repeated this study in four other schools with the same findings. So this is a great study because it goes beyond correlation. And because of the good control, it begins to point to causation. Something about humidification, 40 to 60%, is associated with fewer illnesses. So this study is another incredible study. This was done in 2007 by Nodi and colleagues, looking at the infectivity of influenza A actually in guinea pigs. And again, x-axis relative humidity, y-axis is infectivity. And you can see that when the relative humidity was less than 40%, the, the in, infectivity is high. So the red line is high until you hit 40%. And then the infectivity of the viral particles falls dramatically. And in this paper, they, they concluded that in 15 minutes, when the relative humidity reaches 40%, 80% of the viral particles are inactivated. In, in some cases, that line comes back up again over 60%. It's a little bit dependent on the, the type of virus that, or bacteria. But 40% is a, is a very important cutoff level. Below 40%, you often see increased infectivity. So that's influenza. Let's take a look at coronavirus. So in this graph, you'll see three lines, which represent three different temperatures. So the black line is cold. The, wait a minute, sorry. Yeah, no, sorry, three different relative humidity, same temperature. So on the y-axis, we have days. On the x-axis, uh, viral infectivity. So you can see here that at 20% relative humidity, the black line, you have the longest uh, life so to speak, of the coronavirus. 
at 80% relative humidity, you have some diminution of infectivity. But the blue line, which shows 50% relative humidity, shows a dramatic decrease in infectivity of coronaviruses. So again, 40 to 60% is protective um, against these very infectious viruses. So what happens? What is it about 40%, 40 to 60%? So this is the work of Lindsay Marr at Virginia Tech, showing that if you're sick and the droplets that you exhale come out of your airways, they're about 100 microns in diameter, and they contain all of the stuff that your saliva and mucus contains, proteins, carbohydrates, salts, as well as the infectious microbe. So as that respiratory droplet comes out of your airways and encounters your ambient conditions, if those conditions, depending on how dry they are, those droplets will shrink a certain amount. So for example, uh, here in the middle, you see the droplet coming out, it shrinks to reach equilibrium with the amount of water surrounding the droplet. And if you're at 50% relative humidity over on the right, on the top, that droplet will shrink to a point where the concentration of the salts, mucin, protein, and proteins, the, the concentration surrounding the microbe actually inactivates um, the microbe or, or kills it. However, if you exhale into a drier environment, less than 40% relative humidity, that droplet shrinks so rapidly and the concentration becomes so high that you actually preserve the microbes within the droplet. And when you're over 60%, there's another chemical process that occurs, which again, allows the continued uh, life of the microbe. But at 40 to 60%, the changes in those droplets are such that they actually inactivate microbes, which is absolutely uh, incredible. Dry air uh, preserves microbes, 40 to 60% inactivates them, and over 60%, we believe that the physiological conditions are close enough to the human body that it allows continuation of the microbial infectivity. So that's air, what about surfaces? Well, again, this is kind of counterintuitive, uh, but we now know that surfaces that, are, surfaces that are porous can actually hang on to water vapor. So water in the molecular phase, not liquid water, but water vapor. And if you compare porous surfaces, such as wood, granite, untreated concrete, versus a synthetic anhydrous condition, we're finding that the synthetic anhydrous conditions can actually support more virulent or more pathogenic microbes. Just like a couple of weeks ago, we were told that wood cutting boards actually carry less shigella and salmonella than plastic ones. So wood ones are actually better in terms of uh, decreasing the presence of those things that you don't want to eat. And this is really incredible and very relevant for uh, elderly care facilities. In June of 2018, um, it was discovered that airborne bacteria have some very different characteristics from non-airborne bacteria. So before this study was published, things were as we see them on the left side, where it's gray. Organisms in the air, we thought we knew they were, could be alive, but we thought they were pretty dormant. After this study was done and this new staining technique revealed what was going on, we learned that bacteria in the air can actually scavenge bits of debris. And if those bits of debris are released from either viral particles or other uh, bacteria that carry antibiotic resistance, the scientists conclude that antibiotic resistance can spread through the air. And yes, you should be terrified. Well, don't be terrified, but we need to decrease the airborne um, we need to decrease the biological load of bacteria and viruses that are in the airborne environment. So not only will we inhale fewer of them, but we can slow down the, the, um, this, the passage of antibiotic resistance, which is pretty surprising. So those are specific studies um, or specific buildings or conditions. This is a study I've been doing with the uh, MIT trying to answer the question, why did we see the outbreaks of COVID-19 early on along certain latitudes uh, in, the, in the world? 
what was going on in these countries that contributed to higher disease rates? So to answer that question, we looked at data, massive amounts of publicly available data from three buckets, government policies and public health measures, so closures and uh, mask wearing mandates, et cetera. We looked at demographics, so we looked at population uh, comorbidities, average age, things like that. And then we looked at the ambient environmental variables, both outdoors and indoors. So we gave all this data to the MIT statisticians who were determined to show that there were no indoor environmental conditions. They're determined to prove us wrong that the indoor environment had anything to do with disease transmission. So they analyzed the data and they reanalyzed it and reanalyzed it. And after several months, they came back and said, well, we were wrong. You were right. We hate to say it, we were wrong. They said, in fact, the most powerful correlation they found looking at all of those metrics was when the indoor relative humidity was between 40 and 60, 40 to 65, across the world, Northern hemisphere, Southern hemisphere and tropical countries, there were the lowest number of new cases and new deaths. So even at this massive global scale, we're finding that disease, viral disease transmission is lowest when the indoor relative humidity is 40 to 60%. So in the next minute, let's take a look at this third column. Can we help people uh, support their health and their immunity by managing the indoor environment? And actually the answer is yes. So, so Akiko Iwasaki and her postdocs did this incredible study um, two years ago asking why is it that we get the flu in the winter? What is it about wintertime conditions that promotes or is associated with higher influenza rates? So using um, genetically engineered mice that respond the same way humans do to influenza, they looked at what happens to the mouse immune system at 20% relative humidity versus 50%. So what they found is really another incredible uh, a incredible role for proper humidification. They found that when the relative humidity was at 20%, most of the steps in your initial immune system were impaired. Your, the mucus is too thick, it doesn't trap particles. The little cilia hairs that wash particles away from your lungs weren't able to function. And furthermore, your body doesn't produce the protective proteins such as interferon that are naturally released to help us not uh, get sick if we're exposed to um, airborne viruses. So all of these steps were impaired at 20% relative humidity and optimized at 50. So your immune system is harmed in dry air. And it's not just your immune system. If you're in a room with 20% RH, the average person, unless you have an IV drip going, even if you're drinking uh, periodically, the average room becomes 1% dehydrated in eight hours. And this affects your brain, it affects your respiratory tract function, your eyes, your skin. And so thinking about people in elderly care facilities, it's really important that we don't contribute to memory loss. We don't contribute to balance problems. It's really important to maintain your elderly facilities with this proper relative humidity. This just shows that across different types of viruses and bacteria in clinical studies, 20 to 40% again and again is revealed to be the best zone. Proper humidification is profitable. You know, you might be thinking, what are the first costs? What are the operating costs? It is a profitable, to, to support the health of building occupants um, is a profitable endeavor. But to really, uh, to do that, to take advantage of this opportunity, we have to expand our understanding of buildings from structures that are sustainable, keep people comfortable and are aesthetic. We need to begin to monitor and manage particle levels, exposure to toxins, heat and humidity, not just for each of those individually, but for the impact that they have on people. This is an amazing white paper and Erica's gonna talk a little more about it. Uh, Condare did this white paper talking about monitoring and managing your building for healthy occupants. And if you think about the costs that go into your building, you spend a certain amount on energy, so that's the lower blue line, blue bar. The rent or the mortgage uh, costs some amount. But if you're a business, think about your 
employee uh, salary costs. And so if you could take that top big blue line and increase your productivity or decrease absenteeism, even by 10%, you're going to have a very profitable result. So this is uh, was really encouraging and forward thinking of Canada. Uh, several weeks ago, they came out with for the first, they're the first country to come out with the recommendation that relative humidity in elderly care facilities and in individual homes, but that relative humidity should be maintained between 40 and 60 percent. So this is just an incredibly good move, and I, I thank Canada for for making this recommendation. We don't have forever to get this right. I mean, those of us who are on this webinar, you know, we will be alive for a certain amount of time. So let's let's not keep postponing the acceptance of relative humidity for health. We need to monitor buildings through the lens of occupant health, not just through the lens of particle or exposure measurements. And for starters, maintain your relative humidity 40 to 60 percent you can still do proper ventilation filtration uvgi other strategies but 40 to 60 percent is the baseline intervention that will will enhance those other interventions and will support human health in case you're wondering what the data is clear about humans need air hydration so the mona lisa thanks uh, Condair for being an awesome humidification company. Thomas is going to tell you how to do this. I don't, I'm not into the humidification, humidifier business, but Mona Lisa says thank you because without Condair, who humidifies the Louvre, she would look more like that. So thank you. Thomas, Thanks, Stephanie. All <clears throat> thank you very much. And one, one other thing, I know we're talking about um, assisted living we're talking about elder care here um for those of you that are in the business of elder care a lot of a lot of elder care uh financial formulas say that uh you know if when i get to the age that i want to go into a, a, a an assisted living home or actually an independent home uh you make a financial arrangement with that company there's one that's just up the street from me in pennsylvania that's one of the largest in the state one of the largest on the east coast and that institution that is in charge of well not in charge but has all the financial burden moving forward so when stephanie said it can be profitable it actually could be a win-win-win meaning it's a win for that client or resident it's a win for the ownership meaning lower costs i mean it, it breaks my heart uh, my wife and I will sometimes walk through their property. They welcome, they did welcome people before COVID. They're kind of skittish now, as everybody understands. But it would break our hearts when you see a sign on on an assisted care building within their campus that says, "Unfortunately, we can't have people visit right now because we have a flu outbreak." Um, the, I know that's costing the company money. I know it's putting uh, family members at distress. I know it's putting those people that live there that need help, and it was putting the employees at at further stress or risk. So there there truly is a a win 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 to be had, and and I'm going to show you a little bit uh, more about just a kind of an overview. There's lots of different ways that you could humidify your home, your building, uh, depending on lots of different factors. Um, so moving forward, let's see if I can get this to move forward for us. Maybe Erica's going to have to help. Okay. okay, just one moment. Let me see if I can try it one more time. And if not, I'll move forward. But I thought it was important that Stephanie was saying it's, it, it really can be profitable and really can be a, a, a very big driving factor in, in assisted living and elder care markets as well. Um, and that's why we want to do this today is we're truly passionate about um, showing people you can humidify as well as not only reduce cost of the facility, but you can actually, and sometimes you can actually humidify for a net negative energy cost. So we'll keep moving forward with that. Um, no. I'll okay. let you move it forward. Okay. So just a, just a brief overview, uh, Condair, 
world's largest manufacturer, We've been around for many decades. Just want to give you an idea just so you're comfortable with who we are. So go ahead and next one. Because we're North American, uh, talking, we're in North America today. We're talking about it. I have uh, uh, multiple offices, multiple people like myself, regional managers, and a huge team of highly respected, high-level engineering staff across the country through our independent agent network. And they are just as passionate about humidity as I am and Stephanie is. So we'll go on to the next one. So I just want to give you some ideas of the ways you could humidify. Uh, isothermal or uh, adiabatic humidification evaporation. Um, isothermal simply the old traditional humidifier that most of us think about is we uh, go ahead and put heat under a pot of water, spaghetti water for instance, and we boil it and steam comes out. And we can do something with that steam. We can humidify a building, a home, um, any sort of space. Uh, with the thought of humidification becoming more and more prevalent, we're seeing more and more folks move towards water as an evaporative technique. Um, and I remember as a young boy that my parents had this green Vicks humidifier uh, and it spun at tremendous speeds and I used to pick it up and was be just so puzzled with it. And what it was doing was, just, uh, it was a, a little, uh, little ramp inside a cone in order to bring up just a little bit of water and fling it against the fan. Uh, those are still around today. Uh, uh, they're called rotary humidifiers. We sell some. Uh, but way, even way back in the, the 70s, and I guess I'll date myself in the 70s when I was a young boy, uh, that's that's how they humidified when I, when I had a cold, right? A little pot of water into this green Vicks humidifier, and you'd hear it whirling away and, and spitting out just this little bit of fine mist. It was really neat. So different ways you can do it. Just want to kind of cover those real quick. Go ahead, and Erica. We like using pictures because I think it makes a lot more sense. Steam on the left, isothermal, evaporation on the right, a uh, waterfall, right? So hopefully you've experienced both of those in your lifetime, and you can kind of get an idea of what we're talking about. Go ahead, next one. We we'll also want to give you, a, uh, obviously we're realists here. You know, we're we're not we're not talking huge extremes. We're talking 40 to 60 uh, in the winter time. I keep my home at right around 42. Uh, so if it goes below a little bit, 38, we're fine. Uh, it goes a little bit above that, 44, we're still fine. And I can kind of keep it in a nice little range. But just to give you an idea of, you know, people are always afraid of humidification, or at least that's been the perception because of the upfront cost or energy cost. Okay. Those are the two balancing things that we have to consider for every project is it both an upfront cost and an energy cost. Here below, you can see energy cost. And that's really, um, a huge driver in a new building or even an existing building. And what you can see here is the isothermal technologies are on the right hand side of your screen. So you can see the two right bars that are very big are electric units. The further left we go, the more we get into evaporative water technologies, uh, it, uh, wetted media or sprayed water or an ultrasonic machine or something like that. Uh, if we were just looking at this chart, obviously we'd always want to try to go to the left, but there are many times small loads, meaning, hey, I'm only going to humidify three, 400, 500 square feet. I really don't need that much. A lot of times that electric humidifier is still your best option because this, you can see this is a gigantic load at 40,000 CFM. It would be a gigantic building, um, something like a small room. We don't. We need a fraction of that. So therefore, the cost to doing electric, the cost outweigh the upfront cost of the unit. So next one, Steph, or Erica, thank you. Um, just a reminder, Stephanie talked about this. Uh, we've been showing this for years and years and years. It's the Sterling chart and a, and a little bit of a, a derivation of what we refer to as the Sterling chart. Uh, it's simply saying that even back in the, in, 1985, I believe, is when they did this uh, study, and it's Stephanie's still seeing study after study prove it true day in, day out, is that if we can keep our humidity between 40 and 60 percent, we reduce the problems that we see, even with viruses and fungus and uh, mold and uh, allergies and, and respiratory problems, along with chemical reactions and ozone and those sorts of things. So it's a it's been known for a long time, and then 
obviously much more focused on it this past year and a half or so. So next one. Just a little overview. Uh, these are all the isothermal technologies that we have from Condair. It is um, the beautiful part about this is I come to you kind of like an ASHRAE lunch, uh, kind of the, the trade uh, arm of um, air conditioning, heating, ventilation. Uh, our, I'm proud to say that there is not a technology that I won't show you here today that exists out there that that I can't show you here. We have every single technology available. Just keep that in the back of your mind. Um, I'm going to go very fast over these, but just you know, if you if you have a need, we have a solution. So go ahead, next one. Start out with a a simple, very low upfront cost humidifier. Um, we're talking about a, a simple plastic canister that actually conducts the electricity through the water to make the, the molecules in the water vibrate against each other via friction and creates steam. Uh, very easy to implement, uh, very easy to maintain. Um, it does use electricity, so it's a little bit higher cost to run. However, it's the lowest first cost of any humidifier that you can implement on an isothermal strategy. So next one. Moving along, uh, if if you wanted to boil perfectly clean water, let's say you had a supply of water that didn't have minerals in it, or softened water, or something like that, um, or you had a very tight uh, tolerance, you had a laboratory, and you really wanted tight tolerance, uh, we offer a different style. This is called a heating element style, a resistive element style. It's like your electric water heater, only we can control the element very precisely through solid state relays. Um, just to give you another idea of, of a different kind of humidifier. Now, a little bit more upfront cost, but more of a special unit. Go ahead, next one. Gas. Uh, we sell many, 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 many gas units uh, to the market. Why? Because you get the benefit of easy to control isothermal humidification, meaning I can have a humidistat on the wall and it'll adjust the humidifier to put in just the right amount of steam or into my space to get the humidity where we want. Uh, the beautiful part is is that um, we're burning natural gas, which is much, much, much less expensive. Uh, we do these on indoor units, we do them on outdoor units, and we're proud to say we're the first manufacturer to bring a high efficient unit uh, to market. And Today, we, we are the leader in the gas-fired humidification technology. So next one. If you happen to have a, a be on a university or you happen to be in a, a city where you have live steam or you've got a boiler in your facility, we can tap into that boiler. Uh, the only decision would be, uh, are you confident in that boiler water that everybody's going to be happy that it's in your air? Or do you want to boil water that as we say we'd like to be able to drink the water if you can drink the water you can humidify with it um, so some newer boilers are okay uh, maybe you just want to take that boiler steam and inject it right into an air handler or a duct or into a space or something like that no problem but just to show you that we've got solutions either way so you know in new york city if you have con ed steam typically you don't want to put con ed steam into your building They'll use a steam to steam exchanger. We're just using the Con Ed steam as a heat source, reboiling clean potable water to go ahead and humidify with. Okay. Next one. On to the evaporation side, uh, adiabatic products. Uh, you can see here there are so many to talk about. Um, you know, some large versions, some small versions. Um, we'll just go ahead and uh, move on in there. Uh, these three you see here would be intended for an air handler on the left hand side. Uh, we uh, It's called a media evaporative humidifier. We just pour water up and over this media and as your air moves through it, it cools it and humidifies it. And that's a side benefit for evaporative humidification or using water is we actually get a cooling effect as well. And that can be a benefit to you and your building. Okay. Uh, next in the middle is what's we called high pressure. If you've ever been to a, a Disney or Universal or someplace like that, maybe you walk by and they're spraying a little mist of water. Uh, 
if that water evaporates in that air because it's warmer out, you're going to get physical cooling. That's the idea of it. But we're doing this inside an air handler. Or we could do this inside of an actual building. Let's say you had a large building that had really high ceilings. We could spray water, uh, a really fine mist of water, and humidify and cool at the same time. And last but not least, um, we're seeing more and more healthcare facilities and more and more hospitals move into this technology, which is uh, a kind of a hybrid technology. It's a sprayed water, but we, instead of needing a very long length of air handler, uh, we can actually spray it in a very small section. And what we're doing is we're spraying that water against a different kind of media. So uh, with this media evaporative humidifier, uh, it's a polyester or fiberglass on the on the hybrid one, we're actually using a permanent ceramic media that almost looks like coral. So it's really neat technology and it serves a couple different purposes, energy reduction, humidification and winter time. And uh, for those of you who design air handlers or, or are specifying them, we can do that in a very short area, two to three feet um, compared to some other technologies which are very long. For instance, the high pressure we recommend for proper water usage, six to eight feet. So you can kind of get an idea of the different usages there, okay? Uh, but they all serve a purpose and we have them for reasons. So if you have questions, obviously we're here to help you. Next one. Uh, that's just a picture of the hybrid humidifier. We'll go on to the next one. Uh, I want to give you an example. Remember we talked about you could spray water into a, a into a large facility, uh, think gymnasium, think uh, production floors, think, um, you know, uh, some sort of uh, theater, something like that, someplace where you have large wide open spaces, we can actually introduce moisture directly into it this in this way. So next one. Uh, ultrasonic. Um, today's humidifiers for kids rooms, this is pretty much what you're going to going to go find. Uh, you know, you walk into your local big box hardware or big box retail store. Hey, you need a small humidifier for a room. What you're probably going to find is an ultrasonic unit. What it is, is it's a small little sound puck that sits at the bottom of the tank. And in this case, more than one. And what it does is when you energize that sound puck, it breaks up the surface tension of water, which maybe you remember back to chemistry class in high school, you can fill a glass of water up and keep putting droplets in it until it actually forms a dome on the top of the glass. That's the surface tension of the water. So if we break the surface tension, these little droplets of water will actually float. And so what we can do is we can blow them out into a space with a blower like this and humidify a space. So really neat technology. Next one, Erica. Uh, the study that Stephanie mentioned near her home in Vermont, it's a memory care facility. Um, they have uh, patients and, and clients there that um, they were worried about introducing steam directly into a space that somebody might want to touch it. Uh, and obviously steam would be hot and you could burn yourself. So we introduced this technology to them, which is simply a portable roll around humidifier. Um, they, it has a connection in the back that the facility actually plugs into a quick connect socket into the wall with water. They turn the water on, they run the machine for you know, four, five, six months. Uh, when it needs to be maintained, needs a new UV light or needs a new evaporator pad inside of it, they can just turn off the water, disconnect it, roll it to maintenance away from anybody's who might be wanting to mess with it and go ahead and fix it and roll it back out. So very portable, very compact, very intrinsically safe. Um, my grandparents had something like this. Uh, it was that old roll around drum with a fan in the middle of it. Uh, but this is a little bit more high tech. So um, still around, but uh, have, it, have been improved. So go ahead, next one. Something that's really cool. Really, really cool. And we just introduced it um, earlier this year. Um, we are, this is what's called a tile evaporative. And what it does is it replaces a two foot by four foot ceiling tile. So you can think about that warm air floating towards the ceiling. We can use that warmer air to evaporate moisture. Um, we now have the ability to replace one of those tiles. You bring water to it, you take a drain line away from it, you bring a very low voltage power source. It's only 94 watts. So 100 watt light bulb, and you're getting evaporative humidification right in the space you want. And what we're doing is we're actually reducing cooling loads because for every 
a little bit for every pound of water I can evaporate. I'm taking a thousand BTUs out of the room. So um, comes with Humidistat, uh, very simple, very easy. We've got a lot of, of, of schools in Massachusetts and New York and other places looking at this as a, a retrofit for the school uh, because they're looking at the same studies that Stephanie's showing and saying, hey, you know, if we can reduce our absenteeism at school, if we can reduce the risk in school, we can put these kids back into school and everybody feels much better about our environment. And this is just another different way, another application that we can show you. Uh, but every, you know, we show all these things because not one unit fits every customer. So next one. Uh, water. Uh, obviously, we're talking about water. We're talking about boiling water. We're talking about spraying water to evaporate it. Uh, just to let you know, we're also professionals at treating water. Uh, we have water softeners available. We know how to take chlorine out of water. We also know how to take all the minerals out of water so there is not a messy kind of dust after you evaporate that water droplet. So we have reverse osmosis available. Uh, we build it ourselves. It's matched up to our units, which should give you uh, peace of mind that we know what we're doing and we match equipment to equipment. So next one, and there's rare, rare cases, and we typically see this in, say, electronics manufacturing, that a customer wants completely clean water. There is no minerals left. It's almost pure H2O. Um, we have the ability at that case to also take what's reverse osmosis water, which is really, really clean, but not 100% clean, and run it through a process called deionization. So we're basically like magnets for calcium and magnesium and other minerals. Um, so it passes through this bed of beads, almost like a water softener, but it's attracting ions instead of calcium and magnesium. So just another way, not something you have to know, but just want to let you know confidently that we have this available. So next slide. That's my that's my bit of it. Just a quick overview. I'm going to hand it back to Erica, and she'll finish up, I think, with questions. Yep. So we have a few um, few minutes left for questions, and this may have actually already been answered, but um, there was a question where somebody had asked uh, the T unit was installed in our office. Where does this fit on your scale? So that would be addressed to Tom. If the TE were, let's say, can you read that again? Yep, it says a TE unit was installed in our offices. Okay. Um, where does this fit on your scale? It, it fits in a smaller application, and that's the beautiful part about some of these newer technologies for evaporation that we brought out is it it is meant for a smaller load or smaller um, space. Uh, if you're asking specific spaces. Uh, it kind of depends on how much fresh air you're bringing in. Uh, the less fresh air you bring in, the more area I can cover with it. Um, it is, if you were to look at it pound for pound, it is a little bit more expensive than, say, a regular isothermal humidifier, but there's energy savings to be had because we're not, we get a free cooling effect out of it. So hopefully that answers your question. If it doesn't, call me and we can discuss okay. it more. This one, oh, here we go. Um, yes, we will be providing um, the presentation. It is recorded and we will get the, the link over to you. And then, let me just look. Um, this one, Stephanie, um, when using energy Recovery, is there a concern regarding pathogen carryover between exhaust and air supply? Actually, that's probably more for me. Oh, okay, um, I'm sorry. So what you're probably talking about is a what's called a wheel. So it's a large rotating wheel with fins in it that can take energy from an exhaust side and pass it back to the fresh air side. And yes, it can happen. Uh, you know, I'd want you to talk, talk to the manufacturer of your wheels and talk about that. Um, 
obviously there are other ways to uh, bring energy back without doing what's a wheel. Um, so you can imagine this wheel kind of spins inside the air handler. And if something were to get caught in there on the exit side, it can be then re reintroduced on the inbound side. Uh, there are other techniques that you can use it, uh, glycol runaround loops that uh, can be used or um, not to mention a specific brand, but it's almost like McDonald's, a heat pipe type of situation where you're using energy from one side of the air handler to either heat or cool the other side. Uh, just keep in mind, we can also use evaporative humidification for exhaust cooling if you want to make that more efficient. Um, not necessarily with a wheel, but more of a plate heat exchanger or other other kind of heat, uh, glycol run around loop or heat, heat pipe or something like that. But yes, there, that can be a concern, um, but talk to your wheel manufacturer to talk have them address that specifically. So I just want to jump in here for a second around the coronavirus. There's been no documented transmission of the, the SARS-CoV-2 through HVAC equipment. So theoretically, it is possible. However, we have no documentation of transfer of viable virus through HVAC for what, for what that's worth. Because okay. typically, once you once you pass this air pack, you're going to if if you have UV in your air handler, which is a recommendation, and if you have proper filtration, which is a recommendation, it's any sort of return air is going to run by that anyway. And then obviously, if you up, apply humidification to it, then you're working on the whole building for the humidification portion. So, okay, great. All right, well, it looks like we have um, come very close to the very end, and I just want to address a few things as we're wrapping up. So if there are further questions, please just forward them to the na.info at condare.com, and we'll make sure that we get back to you. Um, what I wanted to tell you is, get, uh, Stephanie had mentioned this earlier, we do have a white paper and it's free. So making, it's called Making Buildings Healthier, that can be scanned and downloaded here. It also can be downloaded from our website, www.condare.com. It is a great resource summarizing some of the latest findings, addressing factors that protect you and your buildings against infectious diseases. And I also wanted to let you know that we will have 10 lucky winners that will receive in our audience today, they will receive a free mini Condair hygrometer. This little device will help you keep track of temperature and humidification in your immediate surrounding area. And if it helps, this is kind of the size, what it looks like. Um, so good luck on that. And then lastly, I would just like to say thank you for participating in our webinar today. Again, if you have questions that we did not address, um, during the session, please do not hesitate to reach out to us for more information at na.info at condare.com or call us toll-free toll at 800, sorry, 866-667-8321. And I'm going to leave this contact information up just for a few more seconds, but this information will also be provided in a follow-up email. So thank you, thank you again for your attendance. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Yeah. And thank you, Take Stephanie care. and Tom. Thank you. Okay, and I'm going to bring this webinar to a close.